So I'd like to introduce Ben Evans. Ben is a Berkshire-based ceramic artist and he's a faculty artist at IS-183 Art School. This talk is part of a series and we're featuring potters that are participating in the Berkshire Pottery Tour. Um, once we get everybody on, I will throw the link to the Berkshire Pottery Tour website and to Ben's website directly in the chat. So definitely check those out. The Berkshire Pottery Tour is happening at the end of September and they've gone virtual this year. So you have a chance to visit everyone's studios and see their work um, without having to leave your home. Um, and Ben has a really innovative talk tonight. Um, he's planned a tour of his studio. So thank you all for joining and I will turn things over to Ben. Well, welcome everybody to my studio. Um, before I give it a tour, I'm just gonna thank Lucy for giving me this opportunity. And um, because we all want things to do and it's been a long time since I've been able to engage with students, this is, uh, I've really been looking forward to this. So one of the, the biggest things for me about the Berkshire Pottery Tour weekend is being able to um, exp you know, work with or show people my studio and show them the way that I work and, and just talk to them about all the little things that I do because I feel like everybody's studio is a little bit different and it sort of seeing somebody's studio and touring it will give somebody, you know, other people or students an idea of what they can do or, oh, he does that that way. Um, and it's, it's a little bit different than going to a, an art school and using their facility, um, using somebody, being in somebody's studio, it's just that much different and specialized. So um, right now, my, my studio is a two-car garage that's insulated that I sort of uh, uh, redid um, so to make it um, nice to work in and uh, comfortable for me. And I just feel very lucky that I have this uh, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's connected to my house. Uh, it's not a very far commute when I'm working in here. Um, so right now I'm standing, or I'm sitting in front of my um, work that's been, just came out of the, the glaze kiln. So all these pieces, usually what I do is they come out and they'll go here for a while until I bring them to a, a show or gallery. And it gives me sort of like a, a place where I can sort of just reflect on what I've been doing. And we can, we're going to end up here at the end and we can talk about some of these pieces. And so I'm gonna start the tour now. We're basically gonna go through about six or seven stations. Um, and I do work in a, very, a variety of different ways with clay. Um, and they are slip casting, wheel working, hand building, um, or, well, all three, right? And, uh, and there's some different things that I do within those. And I'm, I'm gonna show you examples and, and the tools that I use and even um, things that, that I had done differently you know, with equipment. Um, which might be interesting to see. So I'm gonna turn my computer this way and we're gonna walk my sculpture stand here. So we're walking towards, oops, hooked on. So we're walking towards my, the side of the studio is where I do all my slip casting. So here is my slip casting area. I'm just gonna tilt the screen like that so you can see. So I have a slip casting table um, and that allows me to, when I pour my molds, I can drain them right into that if I want to. Um, and it's just a little bit easier versus just working on a, a table surface because it is um, slotted. If you, so I'll zoom in really like this and tilt so you can see that it actually is open down there. Oop, wrong way. Yeah, there we go. So can you guys see that? Yeah. So, um, so there's some dowels that go across and that allows me to keep the molds elevated. And when I drain the molds, they, they can drain directly into there. And that's what it's designed for. And there's actually a pump in here. So I could keep my slip in there and pump it directly into the mold that way. And just to give a brief overview of what slip casting is. So slip casting is um, using liquid clay to pour into a mold. So for instance, with this mold here, I'll bring it to the camera, you can see that there's this inside cavity. And so what allows me to do is pour, this, pour the liquid clay flush to the top and the plaster mold uh, absorbs the moisture from that liquid clay. And then after about 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how thick you want that clay to be, you then pour it out. And when I pour it out, I pour it into my bucket over here. So I have a large um, bucket that, that I mix my uh, 20 plus gallons of slip in at a time. So I pour it into there first 
and then I lay on my slap, slip casting table to, to drain. Um, and then after about, um, after about, well, it really depends on, on the humidity level in the studio and also um, how dry the mold is, but I'll take maybe a half an hour to an hour for, for a piece to come out of the mold. And what will happen is it, it starts to dry and then it just sort of releases from the edge um, of that mold and then you can take it out and you have that piece. Um, so here I have, so it's a different piece, but this just came out of the mold earlier today. And you can see it's very raw looking. There's some really uneven edges that I'll trim off and soften. Um, but this eventually, after it's fired, is gonna be like this. So if you can see here, it's um, sort of an open shell. And this is a very sort of geometric piece. And so for slip casting, it allows you to cast pieces that, I mean, you can cast really anything, but it allows you to cast things that are more geometric or things that you maybe normally wouldn't work or make on the wheel or things that you wouldn't make uh, on with, with uh, slabs, just because it would just be too time consuming. And the other great thing about slip casting too is that just because the piece came out that way, you don't have to leave it like this. While the clay is still in that leather hard state with ceramics, you, we can cut and add and, and change things. So for instance, I have this piece here that is from the same mold, well, the bottom part, part is, but then I added this top part, which is a little bit different. And so simply by using the casting slip as, as a glue, I can attach a piece on there, okay? Does everybody, does that make sense to everybody so far? Yeah. Does anybody have, um, does everybody know what slip casting is or do you want me to go a little bit more in depth into that? Yes, it, no. Do the hand raise if you know what slip casting is. Okay, so that's good, yeah. So I have so a question wanna, for you, Ben. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> where, how do you make your molds? Like where do you get those forms? That's a great question. I was actually going to talk about that stuff as well. So, so there's a variety of ways. There's basically three, three different methods that I use for making what I call my prototypes. And so I can use uh, clay. So you're just taking clay and sculpting it, usually within a solid, is how I made this mold, for instance. Um, so I just sculpted this piece that has very soft edges, and then I cast it. Um, just to show you kind of like what that piece looks like, after, well, this is a, a similar piece to that, just to show you kind of like what that looks like. But so besides using clay, you could also, also use whatever sort of uh, materials you have. So this is actually made out of masonite. And so I, I had a very specific plate form that I wanted to create. And you can see that it has seven sort of lobed sides to it right there. And then, it and then I, uh, so I cut it out of masonite and then I actually filled the interior here with clay and it's something that I learned from this book by Andrew Martin. It's mold making and slip casting. Um, and it's a very uh, good way to get something sort of precise if you have a pattern that you wanna do. And so I glued these together, added the clay in here. I also did the same thing for this, just to show you something a little bit different. So I have this sort of uh, ro um, rhombus shape that has these edges to it. And you can see that there's this cavity here between where the two, the top and the bottom are. And so I filled that with clay. And then along this edge here, I used a wire tool to get it nice and uh, smooth before casting. And then uh, before I cast it, I also put um, usually a layer of shellac or, um, or lacquer or something like that, that, that's waterproofing the surface of this masonite board. Cause it is a little bit, it's like a fibrous board. And when you cast with the, the, uh, the plaster, it's that water from the plaster, you don't want to absorb into that or into your clay. So if your clay is dry, do the same thing, just because you want the plaster to work with that water when you're casting it. So this form made this mold here, it's a little bit bigger. So you can see the mold here, okay? And that made, ended up making this piece here. Okay, so it has, has a slight foot edge to it and I put a little, add, add this little piece in there just so that the, the floor doesn't sag. But this, this is sort of like a fun sort of rhombus tray. Um, and you can see how much, just pick this up for a second. 
works inside here and say, then that doesn't fit. That's not the same thing. You can see how much of the clay shrinks. So this is a porcelain casting slip. You can see like I can, I can put my whole hand in the side here. That's how much the clay is shrunken after it's come out of the mold and then been, been fired to temperature. Um, so um, the other, so that other piece that I showed you before made this mold here. So this is actually, I made two molds for, for this plate. This is actually the foot to the plate. <coughs> and then this is the top mold for the plate. And so I cast them separately and then I attach them. And you can see that this one, the lip goes right to the edge and then you have these very subtle um, sort of edges that, that smooth down. And I'll show you the plate now. And so you can see it has the same subtle edges. And then as I flip it over, you can see how there's that, that, um, that edge there that goes down to the foot and then the foot below. And so the plate is actually is raised up by just that slight little foot there, which is, you know, so, so I, I have this, this sort of motif, this sort of lobe that I call cloud, my cloud series. I'm doing different things than something very geometric in my cloud series to something very um, asymmetric, which is more like this serving bowl here. Um, and it's just this, you know, when, when you get obsessed with an idea, you just continue to, you know, uh, make it in different ways. Um, so before I started that, that uh, rhombus piece, I made a pattern. And I do a lot of sketching and drawing and planning for these pieces because once you get to the mold making part of it, when you're when you're working with the um, with the plaster, you don't really have uh, a second chance. Like the plaster, like once you pour it, that's it. So you, you really have to be really uh, specific with your planning and measure measuring everything out well um, when you pour that pieces. And and so we we talked about the clay using. Um, clay to make a, a prototype for your mold. Uh, I've talked about using a, a board, like fibrous board. You can also use, like if you uh, found objects. So if you had a um, stick that you found or something in the woods, you could figure out a way to do that. Sometimes there's too much detail in a found object to actually cast it. Um, the other way you can cast is, is by, well, the other way that I cast is by actually just carving plaster. So I have this piece here, and this is for like a little, little dipping dish, like a little, um, and so the top of it is round, and then it has these edges that go down to, to a square. It's a very simple piece, but I found that making this one out of plaster was just going to get more, uh, more precise edges um, for something. And so when I, when I have leftover plaster, when I'm casting, what I'll do is I'll pour them into just random containers and so that I have extra plaster to carve into like this piece here. And you can see that I, I drew out lines for where I'm gonna cut and facet. And with, with uh, working with plaster, you can really hone and get your edges precise, um, even more so than the wood. Um, and so if I need something to be more precise, I'll do it with this. If, if the wood just seems easier because it's a bigger piece or I'm going from hard to smooth edges, I'll, I'll use wood with clay to sort of form it that way. But if I, it's more angular, I'll use something like this. Um, and so just one more example for these. So this is that dough, well, it's not a dough decahedron, but it's a, it's a poly polyhedron. So this um, was the prototype and it's been bisque fired and then I shellacked it. So it has this sort of yellow tone to it, but basically just waterproofs it. This was the prototype for for this little piece here. And you can also see how much it's shrunk from, from the original piece you know, to, to the one now. There's a little, you know, it's missing the, the top edge, but I was making a lot of these at one point and I'll show you an image and actually I have some other pieces that are like this, just out of slabs and it was just taking a very long time. And uh, I wanted to play around with, with producing them and cutting them up and changing them. And I've been trying to make um, pieces that are sort of different each time they come out of the cast. I'll add other pieces or I'll cut them apart, put them back together. And this was just the best way to do that. Um, so um, just to give you a little bit more of a close up of my slip casting area. 
So if we sort of zoom in here, um, we this is my tank of, of slip. And so there's a spigot down here where I pour out my slip and collect into a bucket and then I pour it into my molds. Um, I, I made, so you can buy slip casting containers um, through like Sheffield Pottery or, or other places online. And I just, I, I looked at them and I just thought like, I could do that. Like, <laughs> like why pay all this money when it's just basically a trash can with a spigot and uh, a mixer attached to it. And so I was able to sort of zoom in on the image of the mixer and I, I found basically the identical mixer. And then I built myself just a, a, a thing on the wall here to attach my mixer. So it's just a thing that comes off the wall and I can attach my mixer to it and that goes into my tank. Um, and it works really, really well. Um, it doesn't look so, I mean, it doesn't look like some commercial thing, but, it, but it's functional and that's what I'm after. Um, and so I have more of my molds here. So, I, so when you slip cast, you tend to have, need a lot of space for molds. So I have a bunch of molds here. Um, then I have the rest of my molds right over here um, on the other side of my table. And then I have all my sort of main tools that I need for casting. I don't know if this helps if I, no, that's a little bit too bright. So my main tools for casting. So I have my sieve for sieving out my slip when I put into the mold. That way you don't end up with any clumps. Um, my my kitchen timer, which is very important, right? So to get that exact precise thickness, I, I usually start out when I'm casting, I'll cast something at 10 minutes. And then, cause the slip is continually changing as, as it's sort of, um, it's through its lifespan. It sort of loses water, gets more fluid or less fluid. Um, slip casting can be very trouble, I mean, troublesome just because it's, it, it's constantly changing and you really have to understand rheology, which is the science of liquid. Um, and know how to deflocculate the slip and how, you know, and how to change that sort of stuff. Um, I have my mallet here, which comes in handy when I need to knock a mold apart um, to open it up. Um, and then the other thing that I use a lot with, uh, with slip casting is, is compressed air. So I have an air compressor in my studio. And what I'll use that for is if, um, if I see the, the, the piece starting to lift away from the walls inside the mold, I'll just give it just a light little spray of air, and that'll sort of allow the air to sort of go through and, and allow the piece to, to, to come out of the mold. And when they come out of the mold, there's, they can be very fragile. Um, and just like clay, it has memory, so you want to be careful about how you handle it. Um, and I, I make um, pieces that have multiple uh, parts to it, whether it's just a mug with handles or a teapot or whatever, and I just have to be very careful about how I set them, how I handle them, so that the, the piece isn't warping. And sometimes they'll warp a lot um, through, the, uh, through the firing and you're like, what did I do? It's so warped, looks like a taco. Um, so uh, fun things that you can do with slip casting. So this is uh, this sort of low tray that I started making recently. And it's sort of a, a line, sort of, it's a bunch of circles in a line. I don't know if it's hard to see on, on that background. Here, here's a better. So you can sort of see the same form here. And this one, I sort of just repeated the same form on top of itself. So it's sort of like an hourglass shape at the bottom. I cut a little bit differently. Um, and then this piece, I, I added these sort of lines of, so, so basically I, I poured a sheet, like a, a, a slab almost of casting slip. And then I cut these pieces from that, um, uh, from that slab of casting slip and then I could apply them sort of in that pattern and that sort of acts as the foot. So what you see this sort of white porcelain that's actually exposed and then the, the clay uh, you know, underneath is, is raised up. So that's what it sits on. That way I can sort of have the bottom of it glazed. Um, so with casting, it doesn't, even though you're making the same piece um, over and over from the same mold, there, you can cut it up and change things. And that's like, that's what I'm really interested in with casting. I do make a lot of um, stuff that's the same and that's, that's become my bread and butter as far as selling things. But I, I really enjoy playing around with the castings, cutting them up and changing them. Uh, and also just using them, you know, as, as a canvas to sort of uh, test out different glazing styles. And I'll get more to that later, my glazing part of the topic or part of the discussion. Um, so I'm, does anybody have any questions about slip casting? I'm about, we're about to move on to wheel working. Um, 
I have a question for Lucy and Brielle. Ardith is trying desperately to get on here, but she doesn't have her own link. And I sent her mine, but I don't know if it'll work. That's okay. It will. I also emailed her so that she has it, but we didn't get a registration. She must not have finished the didn't understand that she didn't know. do the whole I'll, thing without I'll paying. Set, though. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Does anyone so, have any questions about um, the mold making process before Ben moves on? And, and if we, if you want to jump back to it, if it doesn't come now, it comes later. That's that's fine as well. So so now we move from this corner of my studio. I'm just going to turn it basically 90 degrees this way, and uh, this is sort of the back side of my my house, back side of my garage, and here is my wheel working area. So for scale, when I walk over, this is one wheel here and I have another wheel here and they're very they're old uh, scut wheels and they're the kind that have the the foot pedal on the side so if you can see there so it has the the control on the side here and then a foot pedal on the side there and mine because they are so old I, I don't exactly have the right splash band for them so I've done things a little bit differently so on this one does that look better or worse so, so with this one, I, I sort of built my own splash pan out of wood. And I kind of like this because it it's sort of tapered in a way that just, um, I like throwing better with that. And I, I have them both elevated on concrete blocks, just it's more to the level that I like to use. Um, and then this one I, is, is even more different. You can see this has this larger splash pan around it. And uh, this is something that I built last year. So this is something that I built last year, and it's basically a just a large splash pan. It's very deep. This is about like 10 inches deep, um, and it's it's coated with plastic on the inside, and it slides in there. And this is so that I can collect a, a lot of trimmings. And so the reason that I that I built this is because I was having an issue with when I trimmed a lot, my trimmings would just be all over the floor. And I just wanted to collect them easier. And I didn't really have a great splash pan for this. It was, it was broken. So I built this and it just slides on here like so. Slides there. And then I have this last little piece that I just sort of place on the back. And that just allows me to collect a lot of trimmings. And then the other thing that you'll notice here is is this and can you guys see that? Or should, I'll, I'll close up a little bit back. Yeah, Ben, what's this all made out of? So so this is so that the splash pan is made out of um, uh, tri ply, basically very thin plywood and some some uh, um, some just dimensional lumber, and then the 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 plastic is corrugated plastic, and. So corrugated okay. plastic is kind of like corrugated cardboard, but it's plastic. So I, I use it a lot. So you might have noticed it on the back of my um, casting area. And so mm -hmm. instead of just having the white wall, there's actually two sheets of corrugated plastic back there. And it's just easier. I mean, it wipes down um, with a sponge very easily uh, versus staining the walls uh, that are just so nicely painted. I didn't want, you know, so, yeah. um, so corrugated plastic, really easy to use and cut. And you can bend it. So if you bend it along the, the uh, corrugations, you can really flex it around. And then I just have it stapled in to the inside there. And it, it's not gonna, so because I'm just collecting a little bit of water, but a lot of trimmings, it, I don't need to be fully waterproof. And so I tape the seams just with some duct tape just to just in case. Again, I'm just going for function. It's not for, for looks necessarily. Right. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and so, yeah. So corrugated plastic and, and, and thin plywood. So the other thing that you'll notice in this with this wheel is is this thing here, and so this is uh, an arm that that's made for for throwing. So you throw with it. So basically, what you do is is you have this. Um, so I'm going to tilt this in, so you guys can see that. So you see this little triangle here. So that that. Uh, piece accepts a mold and the mold can be sort of whatever you want it to be. It's something that you need to be able to throw on. So this one's just a slightly concave. So you can see like just slightly concave and then it has that cavity that I cast on the backside. 
Um, and then that fits over top of it like so. And then I cut this piece of plastic here to, to cut that. So this is almost just, this is almost like a, um, well, it's, it's called a jigger or a jolly. So it's this, this technique from like a, um, early industrial revolution era. People still use it a lot, but, but it's to basically make something um, where you're either cutting it from the outside or you're cutting it from the inside. So some people use it with the mold on the uh, sort of like an open mold and you put the clay inside and you cut it that way. It's used a lot in industry. Um, this one cuts like this. So what I do is I'll, I'll, I'll roll out a slab of clay. I'll put it down on here and while the wheel's spinning, I'll spread it out. And the slab's about like a, an inch, well, not quite an inch, maybe it's like three quarters of an inch thick. And then once I have it sort of even and compressed using water and a rib, um, I'll use this and this is gonna go down and it matches the profile except um, it'll leave a very, so it has a, a space for the clay and a space for, for where the foot is created. Um, and I'll show you an example of what I've made with that. So this plate here came off of that. And so you can see it has a slight concaveness to it. And it has the foot that's cut into the, onto the bottom there. Um, so that came off of that. And the reason, and I got this uh, last summer and I haven't used it a lot. I'm still getting used to it because it's, uh, it's very different from throwing. I was just very curious about the process um, as I am with, with everything. And so I, I, I got this, I, I attached it, I created the mold and I wanna make more molds. And my, my thought process for this is wanting to, um, so I make plates by slip casting, I also throw plates, but I want to um, just be able to make larger plates and, and sort of shallow bowls um, sort of quicker and more efficiently just so that I could use them more as, as a, um, a, um, uh, a canvas again for glazing. So I just, I, I, I enjoy all these different aspects of ceramics and my, my goal is to basically just have something where I could have a set of these that are more or less the same, you know, very precise, but also be able to, to, to um, experiment with glazing all, a lot more. Um, so when I choose, so, so when I was in school, I, I think the, the first thing that draw me into that drew me into uh, ceramics was throwing. And throwing is this sort of uh, this process where you're taking something that's just a, a lump of clay, as many of you know, and you're like, it's, it's like alchemy. You're, you're turning it into something. And I just was sort of just mesmerized by that. And that's really sort of where my, my love for clay sort of stemmed from. Um, I've always enjoyed art. I've always enjoyed making things. Um, I worked in construction for about 10 years um, throughout school. And so I, I, I enjoy the process of, of creating things um, and, all, and, and things that are beautiful, but also functional. Like that's the big thing for me is being able to use them. Um, I've done a lot of sculptural pieces um, and I still do sculptural pieces too, but I just find that I'm, I'm always drawn to something that's, that's functional. Um, and so, and I'll show you a little bit more of the, uh, sort of like some, some functional, well, some vases. So vases are, are kind of like one of my favorite forms to make right now on the wheel. And I like to do them in a, in a variety of different ways, but usually there's some pattern involved. So I have, um, this piece here that just adds the sort of zigzag profile. Uh, and, and then I've created a, a pattern on, on the surface. And also these lines are, are made from using uh, some artist tape that I tape onto the bisque square and then I glaze it and then I peel it away so I can have something very precise. And if you can kind of see there underneath the lines, I don't wanna like zoom in on my face, but you can see that there's a sort of like an underpainting that's going on. And that's something that I'll show you later a little bit more about the process. But I, I, with, with these pieces, the pieces that I find that are more sort of like ornamental sort of functional vases, I like them to, to be more than just the shape, more than just the glaze. I, I like to have this sort of complex um, layering happening. Um, just for me, I, I just enjoy it. Um, so, all right. So uh, any questions about wheel working right now? No. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. How's it going, Arthur? Great to see you. 
Uh, this is the first time I've ever used Zoom because I'm I'm here on a wing and a prayer here. Um, um, what was the name? I just I got in late. So what was the name of the machine that you're using to make those plates or the device? What is it called? So so there's two different there's two different um, so so when you use it, it's it's called a jolly or a jigger with a J. So it's like a jolly and jiggering is the is the process. The tool is is usually just called a jolly jigger arm, and it it actually bolts right onto. So there's a weight on there, and it bolts right onto the wheel itself, and then you adjust it. So the plastic die that I that I have on it, I I had to make, um, and I was able to, so I was able to buy the arm that mounted to this wheel. And I was able to buy basically that sort of triangular attachment that that bolts onto the um, wheel head itself, just through the um, the, uh, the, um, the the bat pin holes, um, and then you have to to make your mold. So you can buy molds and stuff too. I, I I'm pretty sure you can, but um, they're pretty basic, I think. I mean, not that that's not that this is anything special, <laughs> but um, but what people do, yeah. It's always fun to make your own. Yeah, and what people do with this, so like when you have a piece of plaster like this, imagine, so now imagine um, thinking about sort of historic pottery um, that has sort of a bas relief, right, in a plate, and it just looks so precise. How did they do it? Well, they had a mold like this that was nice and smooth, and they carved that bas relief into this mold. And so when they press their clay on there, it's creating that impression, and then you cut the, you cut the clay onto it, you know, with with the jigger arm and you get it nice and smooth. And then the, when the piece comes off, that way you can replicate that bas relief each, each time. Um, and so like, that's something that I'm thinking about too, is, is creating some sort of carvings that sort of match or sort of mimic my, my patterns that I work with on something like this. Um, and, and versus rolling the pattern onto a slab and then transferring it over and adding a foot, it just, I feel like this just takes one step out of it for me that would sort of complicate things. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. And if you um, so this, like I said, they still use these in industry. Uh, one major sort of ceramic um, producer in the U.S. is called Heath, H-E-A-T-H, -E Heath Ceramics, and they're out of San Francisco, I think. Um, yeah. If you go to their website, they might not have this on there anymore, but in their website, they actually show people using their their machines, and their their machines are like heavy duty, but it's doing the same thing where they put the clay in, and then they, the arm comes down and cuts it, and you end up with uh, you know something at the end. So all their all their plates, their mugs, their bowls are all made that way. Um, they make mugs that way too. Yeah. So basically, you just have a round mold that sits in there. You put your clay. Um, in that and you sort of press it in and you smooth there there is you know the you, you need to smooth it up the walls and then you have the die comes in and basically just cuts it out it's basically just like it's almost like sticking a wire tool or a trimming tool into the center of the mold and but it just precisely cuts it all out and then you're just left with the thin well whatever whatever thickness that you want of that of that mug wow so wow. And then there's the idea of a ram press. Yeah, ram press is a little bit different. So with that, you're you're basically taking a um, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically a hydraulic press that's coming down with a male and female um, mold ah, and okay. squeezing the clay out of there, and then it lifts back up, and then the piece drops out. Ram presses are super expensive. I would love to have one just because I like tools and trying different processes. One of my friends, uh, Doug Peltzman over in, in Woodstock just got one a couple of years ago. And he doesn't, I mean, he uses it, but not that much, but it's more just like having it and experimenting with it and sort of seeing what, what you can do with it, I think is the excitement for, for me. Um, so wow. right, any other questions about the wheel working area? And I'll show you guys more uh, of the, the pieces that I make on the wheel um, when we get back to that area. So, and then I was just, so before we move on, I just want to show you really quickly. So, so this is actually, this is the door that goes into my, the other part of my garage that leads into my house. So I walk right through there. Um, it's really ni nice. So like in the middle of the night, if I have to check my kiln, I can just get up and check on it and not be sort of 
um, I don't have to, I can just be in my PJs, right? Um, <laughs> then I have my, my little tool area and I have like a lot of different, so just like tools that I, I need sometimes. And then um, this has turned into sort of like a glorified hoarder's nest of, of different things. <laughs> so it's like old pieces or like, or, or rocks that I find that inspire me and stuff like that. And um, I have, so up here I have on the shelf, I have some old pieces. Um, can't really reach up there, but just some old pieces. So I, can't, so I kind of keep them up on the shelves up there. Um, I, I saw a post about that on the Berkshire Pottery Tour Instagram today. If anyone exactly, wants to look yeah. Look. Yeah, so that was one of those those uh, those pieces. So, um, so I try to have as much stuff on wheels as possible. And so I have two drying racks here, um, both on wheels. I can sort of move them around depending on where I am in the studio, like right below or above the light, there we go. So I have two drying racks here. So depending on where I am, I can just move it over. And that way, if I'm casting, I can move it over there and just put things right directly onto the rack. Or if I'm glazing, I'll move it over to the glazing table. Um, and having a space, especially, I mean, my space is maybe like 22 by 22-ish. It's like a square. Um, but I have so many stationary pieces that I can't move. Um, it's nice to have a lot, as much as possible on wheels, especially for, yeah, for working and just creating a better workflow within the studio. All right, so um, we're gonna stop right here really quickly. So um, I talked about, I, did, I do some uh, slab work. And so I have this slab roller here. That's my sculpture stand just squealing a little bit. So I have my slab roller here. It's, um, I think it's like a 30 inch maybe barrel. Um, and I do some slab stuff. So. Uh, lately, I've been making a lot of these um, trays, or I have, you know, like recently, more recently, and they're just kind of like just um, very simple trays that I'm using. So I roll a slab, and then I have a little block of wood that I lay it on um, to to get that sort of raised edge, and then I'm just uh, glazing with different patterns on top. So just a very simple piece. Um, but I've also sometimes do something, some things that are a little bit more um, unique. And so I did a show, well, I, I went through sort of a series of, of, of work where um, I was experimenting with my patterns that I was creating on, uh, on my wheel working pieces and other pieces. And I decided instead of just making them functional, I wanted to make something that was more two-dimensional that, or that was more of a, um, like, a, like a wall hanging. And so these are actually, uh, three-dimensional tiles, so you can kind of see the layers there. Um, and this was all made with a slab. And so um, what I do is actually I, I roll out the slab and I have a, a template for it, so I can cut them all exactly the same, depending on if I'm doing this sort of long format or square format. And then I create a some sort of uh, pattern with wood. Sometimes it's fixed like this, or sometimes it's temporary. And I put a piece of plastic over top of that. And then I actually just drop them right onto it and then press them in and smooth them and refine them to get the, the shape that I want. Um, so, it's, so it's sort of like mold making in a way, but it's just different. And, and with this series, a lot of it had to do with um, wanting to get this sort of uh, water pattern or trying to get like waves or ripples. Um, and so I was experimenting with different ways of doing that. And sometimes I'll actually, I'll make the pattern out of thick coils of clay on a surface, and then I'll put the slab over top of that. And those coils will push up and sort of give you the, the raised edges. Um, I've also, so this is a, another piece that I, uh, a pattern that I created out of plywood. So just drilling in these three inch holes and then placing the slab directly on top, well, with plastic first, and then the slab on top of that. And then I just used a, uh, a ball to kind of like press into the, each of those holes to create these divots to create the pattern. Um, so just kind of like a lot of my process um, sort of involves a lot of sketching first. And sometimes I make mock-ats or, or sort of little examples of what I want to do. And then it's that, so there's that sort of creative brainstorming or creative sort of just sketching and not thinking too much about, just thinking about my ideas more than anything. And then the second part of that is, is thinking about how I'm going to create that piece, whether it's slip casting, wheel working, uh, using the slab roller. Um, 
I, 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 because I, I sort of made my familiarize myself with all these different uh, methods of working. Um, I just feel like I, I, that gives me um, just more, more um, ways to sort of experiment or, or, or what, I, what I guess I do is I sort of choose the best method for creating that piece versus if I was just uh, hand building or if I was just wheel working and I, then sometimes well, just like I used to, I would get stuck within just the wheel. And then finally, once I started slip casting, I, I was, I got into slip casting because I, I had ideas about things. And I didn't want everything to be round. And so I went through um, a transition in my work at that point. Um, so um, something also, so similar to that, um, wow. that uh, polyhedron that I made before. So this, this is sort of what I was making out of slabs at that point. And so yeah. it's um, sort of, so it's a large piece. So it's like as big as my torso basically. And um, uh, it's made of just a bunch of slabs. So I had this idea and I was making sort of closed forms at the same time, but basically I, I rolled out the slab, uh, cut it into the triangles, created those pyramids for it, and then built it up very slowly um, with this sort of, with this sculpture clay. And this piece was uh, wood fired. You can sort of see the pattern on the bottom. Um, I was doing that for a while too, um, and it's just yeah. very, uh, very time-consuming. <laughs> um, very awesome. Yeah. Thanks. I like that. So um, yeah, so slab. So so I use it when I need it, and it's also having a slab table. So so this is basically in the middle of my studio, right next to my glazing table, and just having that surface too is really great for putting work on or working on what I'm not when I'm not using it. Um, the storage is, um, you know, priorities in the studio. So next we're going to move over to this corner. So just to kind of show you my studio when I created, when I renovated the studio. So my studio space used to actually be over in, in the other part of the garage and it was very tight and I was over, uh, I was uh, filling it up very quickly. Um, I, have a, I have a problem because if you gave me a airplane hanger, I would fill it. I just, whatever, just, just I would fill it. So, um, so I have this space and, and I still feel it and I, I feel like it, there's too much stuff in it. But if you can kind of see here um, in the corner, I built a, a small walk-in space for all my glaze mixing. Um, and so it's about uh, maybe four feet by eight feet and it has a door you can walk in. You can see, so I'll just walk in just briefly just to show you scale. So I'll walk in here. And <laughs> And so basically whenever I do my glazing, glaze mixing, I do it in here. So down underneath, I have my uh, buckets of glaze materials. And then above, so like on the counter there, I have my, um, closer. so I have um, a mix, you know, so my sieve, some, uh, my digital mixer. Um, different chemicals, a bunch of uh, underglazes I like to use for when I'm spraying and painting. Um, all my dry materials, like I said, were underneath the bench here. And then um, as I turn, so bring you guys in with me. So over here in the corner is my, my spray booth. So basically it's a walk-in spray booth. So when I'm spraying things, I can close the door, um, turn this on, which you can kind of hear. I'll turn it off because it will get very loud. But basically, I can spray in the corner here. I have, I have um, air, compressed air pipe from my compressor over on the other side of the studio. So it's basically when I when my compressor is on, it's ready to go. Um, I use two different kinds of spray guns. So I have a very um, complicated um, HVLP spray gun here, um, which is gravity fed. So this goes on like that, and I can spray with it. And I can dial up and down the pressure right on the gun here. Um, and this is, uh, um, this is a great tool to have. You don't need this though. Oftentimes the first thing I grab when I want to spray is actually this little tiny thing here. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it's just a, a siphon. So, so it has a little straw in there. You blow in on this end and it pulls the, the material out of here and sprays it. So if I want to do something where I'm just sort of putting a mist of glaze um, across the surface of something, I'll just use this. 
Okay, and then if I want to do something a little bit more complicated, I'll, I'll use the, uh, the spray gun. Um, and there's different kinds of spray guns. I like, I just got used to this in college. So this is the one that I use. I can, I can make it go into a fan, I can make it go into a dot, um, and then you can play around with how much pressure you're giving it to either make, really atomize it or make it more like it's spitting, which can be fun. Um, I, uh, oftentimes when I spray, so I, I have these little um, posts here that's just a little bit of like um, foam material and then it's a stand so I can put like something on here. So for instance, if I was spraying a cup, I could put the cup like this. And when I'm spraying things, it's usually to get some sort of pattern or sprayed effect. So I have this piece here. Um, and so this is a vase. Um, and you can see as I spin it, so there's a clear glaze and then there's a white glaze. So this is the white glaze and then the rest of it's clear. Um, and so basically as it turns, it changes color. Right, and then I have these sort of marks here on it that I that I sprayed on. And so this I did with the, the bigger gun just because I, I needed more to spray with. Um, and I'll create really basic or rudimentary templates out of plastic. I'll just, you know, like this is from, um, this is just some like recycling garbage. So if I wanted, so to create that stripe, I basically just cut this piece and when I spray it, I just hold, hold this in front of it as I spray and I can sort of get different effects if you want to do something like that. Um, ben, this is so outstanding. I mean, I cannot believe how clever you have been in organizing the spray booth and your, I mean, a glaze mixing room is like fantastic to have and you've combined the two. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm so glad to see this, it's fantastic. Thank you, yeah, I mean, so, so for me, um, since I was working in that space for a long time without this, I just knew when I was building this new studio or renovating the space, I just knew that I need to dedicate this because um, if anybody's mixed glazes before, it's very dusty. And basically after you mix a glaze, if you're in your studio, you have to like wipe down every single surface because it goes everywhere. But if I come in, when I come in here and mix, or even when I'm pouring my plaster, so when I'm mixing my plaster, I do it in here, or even when I was, when I was mixing the mortar for the tiles in my bathroom, I did it in here just because the dust just gets collected and, and it's not just going, it's not going everywhere. Really? And what it is, is basically, so this box here, um, it's sort of cut at an angle. I'll just turn this, oh, turn this off. This, that's crazy. Oh, wrong way. So that's a little bit, yeah. So there, there's, um, so there's a filter here, just a, this is like a washable filter that I got from Home Depot, um, just really basic. It collects the dust and then there's a, a fan up in there and there's uh, again that corrugated plastic inside lining it and it curves it to the fan and just it, it, you know any exhaust just goes out there. Since I'm not using any chemicals when I'm spraying I don't have to worry about flammable anything being flammable. Um, so the fan that I'm using is is a uh, an attic fan so it's just an, a fan you know for an attic and again I went on to a, um, a pottery website to buy a spray booth and they're just so expensive. Um, they're great and I've used them before. They're, they're awesome, you can spray them out really easily. Um, but uh, I just didn't have the budget for that. So, so I found a, I, I just looked at their, their fan requirements or whatever and I just found something similar and just adapted it um, to my space. Uh, and then again, on the, on the side here, you can see um, I'm using that plastic again. So when I do my spraying afterwards, I can just wipe it down um, if I want to. Kind of looks nice though. I don't know if you guys like this. See that? It kind of has this um, sort of nice ombre effect going on. So kind of leave it that way. So we'll um, exit the space. Does anybody have, have any questions about the glazing space or the glaze mixing room? No, just compliments. Oh, thanks. <laughs> So uh, the other thing, I don't know if you guys noticed when we're in there, but there's two windows. One's a fixed window, and then the other one is a um, is is actually just a window that's it's like a double hung window. So the double hung gives me uh, I can open this up and allow some some air to to go through. So when I'm or so when I'm mixing, um, there's a cross breeze basically, um, and then this other window 
can see in the corner. So this one, not the outdoor window, but this one has a funny shape to it. So um, as everything that I do before I really start construction on something, I'll go to the, uh, the, the uh, Habitat for Humanity uh, restore and just see what they have because you can find a really interesting shaped window like this. And you can imagine if that wall was just totally solid and standing in there spraying, you'd feel very, well, I would feel very claustrophobic. So it was essential that I had something there um, and that when I saw that, I just I thought that's, that's just perfect. Um, I do have, uh, so this, yeah, is Michelle, sorry. Thought somebody had a question. So uh, I do have a desk here. So I do um, last spring at the, at the end of the school year, I was teaching at, um, uh, Berkshire Country Day School and also at Simon Rock. And so I had to do remote classes and this is where I did everything in my studio. Um, but also it's a, it's a place for me to sort of collect my thoughts, do my sketches. And lately, just because I haven't had um, uh, long days in the studio, I'll, I'll come in here and I'll, sometimes I'm working with my four-year-old daughter making things, but a lot of times now I'm just, I'm making mockettes. So I've been making these sort of uh, small sculptures and I'll tr attempt to kind of show them to you. Um, so these are just solid carved pieces out of clay. Um, and they're just kind of like fun little shapes that I'm sculpting and firing. And I don't know, I don't know what this is gonna turn into, um, but some of them I've decided since uh, one of my projects for last semester um, had to do with Curry Nuki, which is um, making a solid form and then hollowing it. Uh, I started doing some of that. So this piece you can see, it's kind of like, uh, maybe it's, um, uh, it's just overhand size, but it's a piece that is shaped kind of like an, almost like a noodle. So you can kind of see, it looks like it's just spiraling like, like a coil. And then there's a lid to it. So it has, so it's actually open and hollow. Wow. That's cool. Thanks. So this, so I've made a few of these now. Just, uh, j just because, you know, so, and, and when I'm making these, I'm, my daughter's usually, she's making her own pieces. So it just gives me something to do, something that I can sort of work on, but not, um, uh, but, but I can be sort of, um, not be too occupied with at the same time. Um, yeah. Versus like, if I'm casting, I need to constantly go over and change the molds and do stuff and working on the wheel just doesn't go very well with the four-year-old. So, um, this is another piece. So this, this one hasn't been fired yet, but this is kind of like another spiral. Wow. That is lovely. And it's open on the inside. Oh, that is fantastic. Thank you. And so um, I have been having some cracking issues because uh, it's not sculpture clay, it's just normal clay. And for me, that's fine because I'm not thinking necessarily about selling these pieces. It's more I mean, maybe if I would, I would redo it so, so that they weren't cracked, but um, it's just something fun to do. Um, just like, like these pieces that I've made. Another, another material that I like to work with is concrete. So this is actually concrete, cast concrete. Um, and I made these actually at the IS-183 camps that I did. Um, I've worked with concrete before and they're, um, it's just, I like just trying different things and seeing how my ideas um, change in a different medium. Um, I don't know if anybody else feels the same way, but when I draw something or sketch an idea, it doesn't mean that that piece is going to come out that way. It's almost like once you start working with a material, or for me, not, for me anyways, once I start working with a material, it's like you're playing a different instrument and it's going to change the tune a little bit, if that makes sense. It's sort of uh, an analogy, I guess. Uh, so the last area of my studio is here, and this is my, my glazing area. So I have a large, uh, maybe it's, it's a little bit bigger than four by four, but this is my glazing table. I have six buckets on this side, six buckets on that side of glaze. I also have more glaze everywhere else. Um, uh, and uh, I have one side elevated just because if I want to stand and work, um, and then I have one side that's lower. And this is also on wheels, so I can wheel this around. It's pretty heavy duty, um, but it works. And um, yeah, and then also um, from if, if you ever um, want a surface to work on for, for glazing or just something that cleans up well, 
this granite, I think it's granite anyways, it's like a stone countertop like remnants that I got from the, uh, again, from the restore. It just works really well. It's heavy and stays put, um, but it's just really easy to clean and, and durable as well. Um, and then over here is my, my kiln area. So I have my a very old kiln. It's an old l and &L. It's a seven cubic foot. Um, and then I have all my, my, my stuff on my this sort of mobile. Again, it's a, a, a mobile um, kiln furniture right here. So I can move this around if I need to. And then this whole back wall, when I renovated the studio, I put up a cement board um, with the idea to actually finish this with tiles at some point. Maybe I'll still do this. But my idea behind this is basically since this wall is going to be my my um, firing area, I just wanted it to be really um, fire like really safe. So it's you know it's not regular sheetrock. Um, so um, before I start talking a little bit more about glazing, I know that we're getting really close to seven o'clock. Um, but I, I, instead of showing you a slideshow, maybe I'll just show you some of my pieces. But does any anybody have any? Questions so far about anything else that we that I showed you guys? No. Just uh, uh, appreciation uh, for how clever you are. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's really enlightening to see. I think that everybody who goes into ceramics should become, uh, they should have to take um, uh, carpentry classes for a while because everybody has to build parts of their own studio to suit themselves. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something in multiple parts of my life, you know, uh, the building aspect. And for me, it's that I want something and I can't find it. Like you go to a store and it's like, these are your options. I'm like, I don't want, like, that's not the right size. Or I was looking for, for wear carts. All my wear carts are um, like Metro shelving that I've altered. Um, and uh, just because they were smaller and thinner and that's, that's kind of what I needed and it was cheaper. So um, yeah, there's, there, it's good to have different skills and it's good to, yeah, absolutely. And that, that works with your work as well because if you have some sort of construction experience when you're hand building, especially, you can sort of think about um, the, that sort of relationship of architecture and structure and how things are gonna get supported and linear structure, all that sort of stuff. So. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just going to show you uh, some some examples of work and my glazing. Um, how much more? So it's I, it's about seven o'clock now, Lucy. What do you think? I think if I, of course, if anyone has to go, that is fine. You will get a recording of this afterwards. But we could hang on for another ten minutes. This is so interesting, Ben. Thanks for being so generous with sharing so much information. Yeah, really incredible. You're very welcome. I haven't had people like this in my studio in a long time, so I'm just really excited to talk. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to, um, so I'll show some of my stuff instead of showing the slideshow. Does that make more sense? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so um, I, um, going through school, I, I did a lot of different things and I experimented a bunch. I did uh, soda firing a lot. I did wood firing a lot. And eventually I just felt like it wasn't right for my work anymore. And I was really wanting something unique and something that I hadn't really seen. And so um, I started working with a black clay um, body. This isn't actually, a, um, I have an example somewhere, but, but I, I started working with a black clay body and that is the, the color of the clay. Like I just wanted to show that off. I just didn't want to cover it up. And I, at the same time, I was, uh, I was interested in showing the, um, the try, trying to just think less about the silhouette of a thrown piece. So like if you have the silhouette here, yeah, that's interesting, but how can you really experience the full um, piece in, in the sort of like a three-dimensional way? And then, so that's what I started sort of creating patterns on pieces. And so like with this piece here, um, I taped these patterns onto this bowl. And, you know, if this bowl was just as it is, it's, it's one thing, but you add the pattern onto it and it creates just more dimension. It's sort of, you see, for me, like I see it in a different way. Um, so I started doing that a lot more and some got really sort of intense here. And so again, I'm using, with this piece it was thrown, um, this large sort of platter bowl. 
and then I, I did an underpainting and it's sort of hard to see, but I'll zoom in. You can see that there's blue and black, right? That is then, gorgeous, gorgeous. The white, the white is actually the glaze. And so after I did the underpainting, I fired the piece. And then I, at, when the piece was uh, bisque fired, I taped it with artist tape. And I have an example of that in progress. So I have this piece here that I'm starting to tape. Wow. So that's just tape that's on there. You can see how it's sort of just ending on the edges. Um, but it has a sort of underpainting of the blue and the black. Um, and I just, I'll tape the whole surface or as much as I want to anyways. And then I'll glaze it and then I'll peel away that tape. Um, and so now uh, I stopped using the black clay just because it ran out. It was actually, it was left, it was donated and it was just very, so like I started using it and um, it's just very, uh, when you work with porcelain and then you work with stoneware or if you, if you work with a different clay as well, um, you have to be careful about mixing it right. And it, and it was just getting everywhere. It was, it was like, um, so I, I started to just use stoneware and porcelain. Um, and so I'm doing the same thing just with solid colors as well. So this is a, a, a bowl um, just with some pattern on it, a little bit more simple. Um, and then I started to experiment, I started to experiment with um, on these uh, with just more something that's less um, uh, very hard geometric and something that's a little bit more um, touch of the hand. So if I zoom in on this, you can see that this is the white is actually over top of the blue glaze, and this is slip trailed. And so I've gotten into this a lot more lately, um, as well as. Um, using like a brush, so like doing two layers. So it's all glazed, so there's no raw clay. I've done this on these pieces just because they're not, they're more functional and I want them to not be exposed. And so like these are actually marks from a chisel tip brush, just dipped and sort of touched to the surface, almost like a stamp. And then the, the white stripes over top of the black is a, um, is, is again, just slip trailing the glaze. And I got a set of, uh, slip trailers. Um, and so just to see what a slip trailer is, it can be different things. Some people use those um, uh, sort of child's like things that like suck mucus out of their ears or noses or whatever. Um, this one has a very, oh, very um, pointy tip so I can get really fine if I want to. Um, and I can cha change the tip too and put a different tip on if I want to be a different width or whatever. Um, are you using just regular um, like fish sauce slip or something? This no, this is this is glaze. So the, all all my I call it um, um, slip trailing just because that's that's the the term. But it's all glaze. So so I'm I'm putting one glaze over top of another. But you can do it with slip as well. And if you are doing it with slip, using like uh, something like that or something that's more um, just has more fluidity to it um, is better. So this is just glaze that I. Add a little bit of water to it so that it just um, runs smoother. Um, and uh, so just to pull a couple more things off the shelf. So just to show a little bit more of like pieces that were sprayed. Yes, Donna? Just have a quick question wondering if you have any good hacks for uh, keeping the slip trailer tips unclogged. I find that they clog, you know, within minutes of starting to use them. Yeah, so, so one thing you can do is if you have a, a small sieve for a cup, um, mm -hmm. sieve, sieve the, the, the slip or the um, glaze that you're putting in them, so do like mm -hmm. an 80 mesh sieve, and that'll get any clumps out. Um, mm -hmm. And then also I, um, I have a little, like very fine needle that came with a, um, a pen for um, doing luster. And so I use that needle, it's very, very fine. And uh, I use that to clear out the, mm -hmm. um, the tips. Yeah. Okay, and great. Thank you. I have a bunch of these tips, Donna, too. Like they mm -hmm. came with this kit. And so when one gets clogged, I'll take it. And if it's like super clogged, like this one just dried this way, which is just not good to do. So I'll put it in a cup of water and let it dissolve. And I'll just use a different tip until mm -hmm. that one's less yeah. clogged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I have, um, I have a bunch of pieces back here. And um, I won't talk too long, but just to show you just examples of stuff that I was talking about before. So you can see um, the the color, how it changes on this piece. Nice. So this, this piece was one of those that was sprayed with multiple colors before this firing. Um, I, uh, 
This is one of my more favorite pieces that I have here. So this was thrown and then altered. And so you can see it's very, um, has these very faceted edges. And so basically after I threw the piece, I put my hand inside and basically pressed out the pattern that I wanted and then just reinforced it once it got more to a leather hard state. Um, it's kind of fun, it has a red on the bottom. So just another piece like that. Um, this is again, so this is one of those, so this one wasn't sprayed, but this, this pattern was painted on. So just doing layers, doing like a underpainting and then putting the top painting over it and revealing that painting um, is kind of fun. Um, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I could go on talking about the stuff, so. Um, so. Does anyone have final questions for Ben? Um, if there's so many things I could ask. <laughs> yeah. But not, not everybody here would be uh, interested in all the little fine points that I wanted to ask. Uh, I, I, but I will see you at some point and ask for more clarification later. But this whole thing has been really enlightening. Yeah. It's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. really wonderful. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. It was, great. it was great seeing everybody. And... Um, just want to just plug the tour one more time. So uh, the last weekend of this of September 26th and 27th is the Berkshire Pottery Tour. We will be uh, digital this year. Um, some of the guests, uh, so some of the potters are going to allow um, one visitor or one group of people to come through the studio at a time. They just need to arrange that in advance by emailing that potter directly. And if you go to the website, berkshirepotterytour.com, um, You'll, you'll see the different guests and it, the, that will bring you directly to the, uh, the, the different potters websites that way. So take care. Bye-bye.